Let, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that your word brings light. Your word is a seed sown into our hearts. We thank you, Lord, that your, your word brings us into your kingdom and into your protection. And so, Lord, as we read your word tonight and think about it and dig deeper in it, we pray that your spirit will guide us and minister to us. Amen. Amen. Looking at the uh, Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 21 to 41, um, some of the parables of Jesus, um, which uh, was put into the uh, readings for Sunday, looking at small things becoming big. Let us read. I'm reading from the New International Version. Jesus said to them, Do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces corn, first the stalk, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. As soon as the corn is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up. And the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, be quiet, sorry, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. God's word for us. Right. Um, Jesus talking about a lamp. And one can't, if you're talking about the kingdom of God and light, you can't not uh, relate it to Jesus being described as the light of the world who came into the world. Um, and so uh, Jesus looking at the gospel and the good news and the message that he was bringing and saying to the disciples, essentially, lights are there to be put on stands, not to be hidden away. Um, and as he's teaching through uh, about the kingdom of God, and you'll see the next, the next parable is the kingdom of God is like, and the next one's the kingdom of God is like, um, and previous to this, he was also talking about the kingdom of God is like. Um, 
and is essentially saying this is going to be a public uh, and visible reality. Uh, it's going to be put on a stand for people to see. Um, and then a challenge to them, if anyone has ears, let them hear. Uh, one of the translations, I think it's the um, New English translation, has, if anyone has ears to hear, he had better listen, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a wonderful translation because, uh, and the comment that they had in that is, is that in the Greek, let them hear is the third uh, written as third person imperative. So it's uh, an injunction, you must do this. Listen. And, um, and back in the 1600s, when King James had his scholars translated, let them hear had a more forceful meaning than it does today. Um, today, it's quite a passive, uh, they can sit back and listen um, and let, let them have a listen if they'd like to kind of thing, where there is a much, much uh, uh, more forceful, you'd better listen to this. And um, so whenever we read in the scripture, if anyone has ears to hear, which Jesus says on a number of occasions, let them hear, he's actually saying, you'd better listen. And as we're listening, he says, consider carefully what you hear. Um, and as you listen, um, it will be measured to you. The measure you use will be measured to you. And I've heard this on more than one occasion taken into the realm of when you give money to the church, the measure you use will be measured to you. So therefore, give us as much money as you can. And that is completely not what, what this <laughs> it is saying in the text. There's no mention of any kind of giving, of any kind of resources, of any kind of support or anything like that. Um, Jesus is talking about listening to the teaching for the kingdom of God. And so it makes most sense to me to saying that if you're going to listen diligently, if you're going to pay attention to what is being said, if you're going to uh, put in that, that effort, the necessary effort to listen and to hear, that, that will bring its rewards. The more you listen, that will be measured to you. So if you're going to put in, uh, take it seriously, the, um, that same seriousness and diligence will be measured to you in terms of your growth and your understanding and your um, apprehension of the kingdom. Uh, and then goes into whoever has will be given more, which then, again, makes sense of the, if you're listening, if you if you're listening with diligence and you have that kind of attention and care, it's going to grow. And you find that when you start studying scripture, even if it's just a small bit and you get to understand that it grows and uh, it will become more and more and more um, true. Whereas if you completely ignore it and you're not prepared to put in that effort, that interest in scripture is likely to disappear and be taken from you. There was a, a good note on that. Which let me just read to you. And they say the meaning is that the one who accepts Jesus' teaching concerning his person in the kingdom will receive a share in the kingdom and even more in the future. But for the one who rejects Jesus' words, the opportunity that that person presently possesses with respect to the kingdom will someday be taken away. Um, those that were prepared to listen um, would hear and would grow. If you weren't prepared to listen, you might well lose it. So, uh, Jesus, the, uh, Mark then goes on to record a second parable of Jesus. He'd spoken earlier in the chapter about the parable of the sower, um, sowing on different kinds of soil, and that same kind of illustration is picked up again. 
He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like, speaking about God's kingdom. And throughout uh, Mark's gospel, that's a major theme of Jesus' teaching. And he's setting out what the kingdom of God uh, is, is like and how best to, to understand it. Uh, and again, a note it says the nature of the kingdom of God in the New Testament and in Jesus' teaching has long been debated. And this is something that uh, you'll have people uh, raise at various times. Uh, is the, the kingdom, and they say that there are two aspects of the debate, is the kingdom primarily earthly or is it primarily a heavenly kingdom or is it both? And has the kingdom arrived in the present uh, or is it looking to a future kingdom or is it both? Um, and my sort of understanding in the, is, is that it's generally both, that Jesus isn't just talking into the future, look down the line. He's also speaking to the people about their religious experience and what they're doing and how they live here and now. But it's not just for here and now. There is also a future dimension, and we need to hold both. Um, and likewise, it's an, uh, we, we live out God's kingdom on earth, but we also know that there will be a kingdom in heaven. Um, and so the Jesus teaching isn't a, uh, a mandate for social action only. And it's also not just pie in the sky when you die. You have both of them as we look forward to the kingdom of God. He says the kingdom is like a, a man that scatters seed on the ground. Um, and one reads this and immediately thinks of the, the sower, which has come before, but it has a different perspective here. He says he sows the seed, and then he do, does nothing more. The seed sprouts and grows, and he doesn't know how it happens. Um, and in Jesus' day, there was no science to explain what was going on. Um, and you can imagine, and even today, the notion that you can plant a seed and next thing this whole big tree or bush grows from it is quite remarkable. How does it work? How does that little thing get changed? <laughs> um, and biology, and if you paid attention in your biology classes and you did that planting of a, of a bean down the side of a glass and you could watch the root growing and everything happening, um, uh, it's not quite as mysterious. But the point is, is not that it's mysterious, but that, that it grows by itself. The seed in itself has the ability to grow. Um, and uh, it will grow up because it is the, uh, the seed. It is the kingdom will, will grow and develop. We don't have to do our own work to make it happen, God does that. Um, and this is the only place that this parable is found, this parable of the seed being planted and growing of itself. It doesn't occur in the other Gospels. And it, it looks at uh, the whole uh, uh, nature of the kingdom, that the kingdom is sown, that it starts off small, that there's growth in the kingdom, and that there will be a harvest. Um, and uh, it's looking to the, uh, the mysterious growth that is accomplished by God. We don't have to understand it. We just trust God for that growth. Um, Uh, it was, and uh, yeah, as it talks about uh, in the New International Version, it has all by itself the soil produces corn, um, and the the Greek there is translated corn because the interpreters would actually 
use whatever is the main cereal crop of the district where the, the message is being preached. And so the NIV has a very strong um, American influence being uh, done by the American Bible Society. And by and large, corn is one of the major crops of, of Europe, uh, of, of America. It would probably be wheat um, in much of Europe. Um, and it could be barley or spelt or what, some, some other crop, depending on where it is. And the nature of the crop isn't uh, particularly important. It's the fact that these crops, and all of them start off as a seed, you plant them, and then they grow, and eventually you harvest from them. And so you have this, this uh, looking at the kingdom as something that grows by God's action, not by our work. And then Jesus tells another uh, parable again. He said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? And what parable shall we use? It's like a mustard seed. Um, and again, looking at something that is small and that grows and very quickly, in, uh, apparently easily, becomes large. Um, so... Um, the, and the, there's an, I've heard people take issue with this and um, so <laughs> thinking where they say Jesus says it's like a mustard seed which is the smallest of all seeds on earth and people have said ah but that's completely untrue therefore we can dismiss the Bible as nonsense because we all know that the mustard seed isn't the smallest seed on earth. What about um, poppy seeds? They're much smaller than mustard seeds. And therefore, uh, and <laughs> the point is that that's taking a, a literalistic uh, way of reading the scripture. And one has to read scripture understanding uh, what is happening. And Jesus is quite clearly, he's not giving a science lesson here. He's not saying these are the scientific facts. He's using something to illustrate the point, which is you take something small and it becomes big. Um, and it's been pointed out that in the, the Middle East, in Jesus' day, they weren't growing poppies. They didn't have amaranth or all these other teeny, teeny seeds. And for the vast majority of people that Jesus was speaking to, the, the the mustard seed was probably the smallest seed that they would regularly work with. And so he's not making a scientific statement about seed size. He's illustrating the fact that the kingdom grows. And he's saying, take the, the smallest thing that you plant, a mustard seed. It's the smallest seed that you've got. Um, and it will grow to become a major, a big plant that birds uh, can can preach in. Uh, can so not preach can perch in, <laughs> and uh, then carries on. And Mark makes the point with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, um, and uh, he did not say anything to them without using a parable. Again, uh, Mark uh, using a figurative. Um, thing to to ex express how Jesus would use parables to teach the people. Now, clearly, he did say other things to them that weren't parables. And you have teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. You have various other teachings of Jesus where he wasn't using parables. Um, and so this is not a, a literalistic um, uh, uh, statement that when Jesus spoke to the crowds, he only used parables. But it's more that um, as Jesus was teaching, he used parables to illustrate the teaching, to make the teaching accessible. Um, and most of what he was teaching to the crowds, he would use parables so they could understand. And he wasn't using the same kind of teaching that the scribes and Pharisees would use, where they would recite what other teachers and other uh, rabbis and people had said. So he wasn't giving these long uh, uh, treaties on on uh, the kingdom, he was illustrating it. Um, and so 
uh, as Mark says, he, he didn't use those other forms of teaching. He used parables to teach the people. Um, so, yeah, it's not a, a, a literalistic statement. It's a, to illustrate how Jesus worked. And the other interesting thing is that, that he says, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them. Um, and clearly, Jesus spoke and taught a whole lot of stuff to the people which we don't have recorded. The gospel writers selected from what Jesus had said, selected from the teaching and recorded it um, for the purpose that they were writing. And so Luke, as he records his, his gospel, is quite clear he's writing for Theophilus so that Theophilus will know the truth. And he puts things into the gospel that will help achieve that end. Um, and none of the, the gospel writers would, would claim that they have recorded everything Jesus said, because that clearly isn't the case. And John here quite, um, not Mark quite, here quite clearly says, there were many other parables Jesus taught. Um, uh, and he always used parables to teach the people. So um, as we read the gospels, there was a whole lot more that Jesus said which we no longer have recorded. But what we have recorded is what we need that we can understand, that we can come to faith, and that our faith can grow. So Jesus has been teaching the people. He then gets into the boat, um, and they go across to the other side. Clearly, they're talking about the other side of the lake, although... The word lake isn't in the Greek. It's implied. Um, and he moves away from the crowd, taking his disciples with him. And uh, there's a note that they um, quite recently um, uh, found a boat um, on the shores of Galilee. In 1986, there was an extended period in the lake levels dropped and a fishing boat from the first century was discovered on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, excavated and carefully preserved and is now put into a museum. And let me do a, let me just quickly find it. Um, no, not that one. I'll do a screen share with a picture of the boat. So, uh, share the picture. I don't know where it was. Screen share and share. Yeah. That is a, a picture of the boat in the supported by a, a trestle and the boat in the center there. Um, let me just have a more pictures of the boat being excavated. And then they've made a model of the boat of what they think it would look like. And so there's no indication that this was exactly what the boats were, but it was a fish fishing boat from the first century, from the Lake um, uh, Sea of Galilee. And so it was most likely that the boats described would be something like this. Um, me then. Just in now, I've got myself completely lost. In fact, yeah, stop the screen, Jerry. Um, and the boat itself was about uh, eight, eight, and sort of eight and a quarter meters long and about two meters wide. It would be rowed by four rowers, uh, had a mast and a sail, um, and could have fitted the um. 
the disciples. It was a reasonably big boat. It wasn't a tiny little boat. It was fairly big and could probably take a fair number um, of disciples in it. And so that would be the boat that Jesus got into as they were crossing. Uh, but it's also been pointed out that it uh, was not a, didn't have terribly high sides and was fairly close to the water, which would make sense if you're fishing from it, that you could sort of get nets in and out of the water more easily. But it also meant that when there were storms, the wa waves could break into the boat quite easily as well. And that is exactly what was happening with the disciples here as the storm came up. Uh, it's also uh, sort of the notes made that the, um, the Sea of Galilee being in a depression and with desert all around, the, the weather is quite changeable. Um, and on hot days with, with great updrafts and uh, uh, the uh, weather coming in from the, the uh, Mediterranean as well, it has been known for storms to break upon the lake almost without warning that you can start off with a, with a fine day and very, very quickly it can turn and have quite a, a serious storm breaking over the lake. Um, and that uh, happened with Jesus. And he is sleeping on the cushion and the disciples go and wake him up and say, don't you care that we're going to die or that we're going to drown? And Jesus gets up and rebukes the wind and says to the waves, be quiet. Um, he challenges the disciples. And they then say, uh, raise a question, who is this? Um, because for uh, them in... Uh, the Old Testament, it is quite clear that God was the only person in charge of the weather and that could control it. Reading a note from Psalm 107, we have some traveled on the sea in ships and carried cargo over the vast waters. They witnessed the acts of the Lord, his amazing feats on the deep waters. He gave the order for a windstorm. And it stirred up the waves of the sea. They reached up to the sky and dropped into the depths. The sailors' strength left them because of the danger. The danger was so great. They swayed and staggered like drunks, and all their skill proved ineffective. They cried out to the Lord in their distress. He delivered them from their troubles. He calmed the storm, and the waves grew silent. The sailors rejoiced because the waves grew quiet. He led them to the harbor they desired. And as a psalm for all their life, which is probably 30 years or whatever, the disciples would have sung that psalm at various points and various occasions. And so that would have been part of their background of their understanding of the world and of God. Um, and no doubt as fishermen, that psalm they, they've taken careful note of, a God controlling the, the waves and the wind. And so here, Jesus standing up and speaking to the waves and the wind uh, revealed who he was. It was a, a, a statement of his identity. And the disciples at this point had not yet got their heads around of exactly who Jesus was. And so one can understand here was this friend of theirs that they'd met, this great hunter who'd done some good woodwork and they were following him and he's a great teacher and better than the scribes and the, the teachers of the law in the synagogue. And they didn't view Jesus the way we do. Um, <laughs> we have the whole of, of his, his life behind us, kind of. They were in the midst of it. And suddenly this friend of theirs, this chap, just another chap, Quite remarkable chap, but sort of stands up and tells the waves to be quiet. And they recognize that's what God does. God calls the, the waves. God quiets the storm. And Jesus did that. Who is this? Um, 
And then one of the commentators looking at this made an interesting point, which I had noted before. Um, as we, we read it and, and, and think of what how this applies to our lives, does this mean that we now have authority that if we caught in a storm, we can just stand and say to the storm, be quiet, and it will obey us. Um, and if this was the only passage of scripture, we could um, probably make that kind of conclusion. But if you look at the whole of scripture, uh, the question marks raised, you think of the number of times Paul says he was shipwrecked. Um, and Paul was a good and godly man. Um, far, had far, far greater faith than these disciples had that were around Jesus. And he was shipwrecked um, on a number of occasions. Um, you have that, that story towards the end of Acts where they were driven by the, the, the storm for days on end. And if Paul could have stood up and said to the, the wind and the waves, quiet, be still, and they would have stopped, he would have had a great testimony to the entire crew and all the Roman soldiers and everybody with him, and they would have got to shore safely. They wouldn't have had all the drama of the shipwreck. Um, but it didn't happen. Um, so maybe when we're in a storm, we're in a storm. They also make the, the, the comment that throughout the New Testament, you only see Jesus controlling nature. Um, certainly when the disciples are... Um, taking the good news, they perform wonders and they heal people. Um, but there's nowhere in Acts that they quiet the storm. There's nowhere in Acts that they multiply loaves. Um, those are exclusive to Jesus. Now, how significant that is, we, sort of, I read this comment today, so I'm still going around my head mulling it over. Um but worth, worth thinking about. So I'll leave it with you to, to ponder. Um, but as Jesus does this and, and um, his miracles that he, he performs, um, uh, one, one person says that he, when it, Jesus performs miracles, they're never meaningless magic. They always reveal who he is and underline what he's saying. And so Jesus um, uh, here reveals his authority and reveals himself as the son of God, um, as having power over nature. Often when he opens the eyes of the blind, he is done in, in conjunction with, with teaching about the kingdom or whatever, um, and he's bringing light and helping people to see the truth and he opens the eyes of the blind. Um, uh, and John is quite clear. He, he records in his gospel, he records very few of the miracles, and he always refers to them as signs, this sign that Jesus performed. And it's always used to illustrate something about Jesus' nature and about the teaching that he gives. And so here we have... Uh, Jesus revealing himself in this miracle. Right. Comments, questions, thoughts, observations. If I might make one comment, uh, can you hear me? You may. Yes. Um, just as a small thing about the, the use of the term corn. When I was growing up in Britain, corn was applied to wheat and oh, barley okay. uh, and oats. So um, uh, the only corn, uh, well, the only distinction might have been sweet corn, which was sold as corn on corn stripped off a cob and sold in a can. OK, that was my that was my uh, my generation. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, there might have, you know, there might have uh, might have had maize on the can as well, mm. but it, the, they tended to call it sweet corn. Leave it at that. 
Now, everything else uh, with ears hmm. uh, uh, was 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 generically corn. Corn. Oh, okay. Would you agree with me? I have an older version of the NIV, and it refers to it as grain. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Easier. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, so. laughs> But I think it also illustrates a, a a principle that people use in Bible translation, um, and it's a, a, a debate that people have: is how close to the text do you remain, even if it ends up obscure, and how or, or do you take what the, the the original Greek says and use the local idiom to convey the meaning. Um, and I think that that's that that I gather is an, is an ongoing debate amongst Bible translators and which is the best and how you do it. And so, yeah. And in fact, different translations set out to do that. Yes. Some of them say this is word for word as best mm -hmm. we can do, or this is trying to convey the sense of it. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, if you're really radical, you you say this is a paraphrase. Yes. Uh, Jeanette, you're on mute. That's the wrong button. I'm muted. I need to unmute yourself. Yeah, the camera. Yeah. <laughs> I had the same trouble with the phone. Oh. I said I had the same trouble if I ever use my phone. Yes, no. I've, I've done Zoom once on a phone and it was just, a mild disaster. <laughs> it's a smartphone, but not necessarily a smart user. That's right. <laughs> they know who they're selling phones to. Let's keep this the phone smart. <laughs> right. Any other comment, Janetti? Um, you've you've turned your camera. Uh, your camera's back on. You're still muted. So it will be one of the other buttons that you'll need to press. You clearly haven't been on a, one of our Zoom calls for a long time. Your, your holiday overseas um, yeah. betrayed you. <laughs> You've lost your touch. You used to do quite, quite easily. <laughs> no, okay. Okay, can I say something? Well, please. Yes, yes. Um, Go ahead, Gilbert. Jesus said, whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. And whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. And then emphasize yeah. that if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. And it's possible in my mind that that is a, uh, a statement of, of a greater truth. That that is just how things are. And that... Truth, with a capital T as such, uh, is is always going to um, is always going to triumph. Mm. Just thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, uh, standard saying: the truth will out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that that is quite likely part of what it, what he's saying here. Yeah. Have a look at what another translation says there. Um, because the one translation I've got here then has it, for nothing is hidden except to be revealed, oh. and nothing concealed except to be brought to the light. Um, and seems, uh, let me look at New Living, is everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open and every secret mm. will be brought to the light. Mm. Um, so, and I think it's Jesus speaking to the disciples at the time where they're a tiny little minority um, and 
he's busy teaching them up around the shores of Galilee, which is a small little, essentially a small little backwater um, where there's no great significance because everything big and important happens down in Jerusalem or in Rome, and they're not there. Mm. Um, and almost he's talking about the kingdom, saying it might be hidden and small and happening sort of behind the scenes now, but it is going to be brought into the light. It is going to uh, 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 make a statement. It is going to be revealed in a much wider mm. context. That links up with um, Jesus at various times, uh, uh, mostly in John's Gospel, but elsewhere, uh, the use of parables uh, is to, in fact, obscure the forcefulness of his message in the early days of his ministry. Because, as he said to his mother and to others, my time has not yet come. Yeah. Uh, the hour has not yet come. So that's why he didn't go up to Jerusalem when his brother suggested he did and things like that. Yeah. So um, he was using parables for people who were interested in understanding and gained spiritual insight, uh, or, or sorry, the spirit helped them interpret the parable yeah. uh, because he wasn't going to be uh, really plain about what he, uh, what he means until he, uh, let's say in the last year of his ministry and he gets close to Jerusalem. Mm. Also, can you hear me? yes. Can you hear me now? We can. Ah, no, just about this the storm. It is quite extraordinary how that happens. I remember one sitting by the edge of the lake, and it was as calm as you like. And all of a sudden, a storm blew up. And the waves were washing over, practically washing over me because I was so near the so near the edge of the lake. And in next to no time, it subsided again. It, it was it was quite astonishing. Sure. One minute it was plain, then the next minute it was all whipped up, stormy, and the next minute it was quiet again. Back up yeah. Yeah. And there. Uh, what the people were saying that the, the, lake, the Sea of Galilee has that propensity to <laughs> have sudden dramatic storms. You... Yes, because the, the wind, the, there are gullies on the other side of the lake on the Golan Heights, and the, the wind comes blowing down there. Yeah, so your personal experience bearing out what, what people have commented. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wonderful, yeah. Other thoughts and comments? No one cup when you give me what does what on the beach. You don't don't keep keep alert all the time. <laughs> okay. Oh Ian, just I'm sorry, this is just a little personal remembrance. When our son Joshua was um living and working in Papua New Guinea, and we would go down to the beach, but we were told all the time to be alert because you know the the storm could blow up the waves and the sea could just dash yeah. onto the beach yes it, it was just, oh my goodness mm. why my look at this um you have to it wasn't just what it looked like for a bit mm. Mm. it could change it was the changeability yeah. of it all yeah Plus tsunamis, of course, because uh, oh, they're yes, very, it's tsunami, a volcanic yeah. area. Yeah. But I think it's, it's, it's that, just in that comment, I, I've seen that <laughs> where every now and again you, you're at the sea and just there's two or three waves which get higher and higher and are remarkably high, and then it goes back to where it was. And we were once at, I think it was Uvongo, we were quite far up the beach. A long way away from the water, um, and all of a sudden a wave came in and it just swept right up the beach. Yeah, um, yeah. So beach is further up than, than where it had been up to that. 
the old people jumping up and grabbing towels and <laughs> trying to rescue their stuff went back down again. And then it, uh, that was it. It's just a one wave which, <laughs> which took everyone by surprise. So, yeah. Right. Any other comments, thoughts on the, yes, the passage? Yes. I wanted to say thank you for opening up verse 24 and 25. That really was um, sort of new to me. And it also ties up quite nicely with Jerry's, Jerry's challenge of Sunday to read the Bible in yeah. a year and see how many times we can do that before we die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Many times to read the Bible. All the way yeah. through. I wanted to comment on that as well. I mean, it, it does say, um, Jesus said, this translation, NIV says, consider carefully what you hear. Mm. I also think that might is sometimes comes out a bit better, is consider how you hear. In other words, it's the effort you put into listening, hearing, understanding. And in fact, we've got the Living Bible here as well. And it says, remember to do what you hear. So it's all that. It's a sort of an active process. Mm. Yeah. Ian, could you explain? Um, I seem to have remembered whether I read it or, or heard somebody talking about it. Um, in Jesus' first comment, let's go over to the other side. And then after the storm and that, and he rebukes them. And I think the comment was, was that, you know, they were going to get there because Jesus said that's where we're going. And um, I, I've enjoyed what you've you know, spoken about him showing who he is, that he is God, mm. that he can still. But um, is there any merit in that, that he was rebuking them because, well, you know, he said, come, we're going to there. So we're going, we'll get there, regardless, of, in a sense, regardless of there's a massive storm just about to overwhelm us. Is there anything in that? I mean, there, there, that, that, that could be, yes. That, Sort of, uh, because his challenge to the disciples is still sort of looking at their faith. Um, um, you still have no faith. Um, so it may well be that yes, if Jesus if that's his intention, that, that's what will happen, and you should know that by now, kind of thing. Um, that there is a there's also uh, a, a a faith building message there too, which is. Wherever, if you're with Jesus, you're safe. Um, wh whatever happens, because yeah. it, and if, sorry, if you're following Jesus's in uh, um, command or um, uh, his, his instruction, then then you are safe. Mm. Uh, so you need not worry as long as you're with him. Um, I heard a comment on that recently, but I then turned to Ruth and was reminded how. Our son Joshua, after Papua New Guinea, was offered a job in Iraq just after the Gulf War. And he was uh, much exercised about, and so were we, of course, about how dangerous it would be uh, to go into a post-war uh, uh, zone. Uh, it certainly wasn't safe, and uh, he had lots of uh, anecdotes after that. But our conclusion, that the, the, the three of us, parents and, and Joshua, were that... Uh, as long as he was with Jesus, then that's fine. If he's if he's meant to come through it alive, that's fine. If he's not, doesn't matter. He was with Jesus, yeah. and somehow we got a peace from that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is going to be right. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. it took the hand to let us. Yeah. Of preparation. Oh my goodness. Let us yeah. pray in that case. Lord Jesus, thank you for uh, your word that does bear fruit. Thank you, Lord, that we are part of your kingdom and we know that it, it is growing, even when we don't see it growing. Lord, so often we can be discouraged when we look around us and think oh there's no growth but your word is that that the growth happens whether we're aware of it or not because it is you that brings the growth and it is your kingdom so thank you lord that we are part of that 
Lord, we pray that as we journey through life and read and study and come to know you more, that that will lead us to deeper and deeper faith in you. And thank you, Lord, that uh, we know that with you um, in our lives, as we walk with you and follow you, no matter what we experience and go through, we know that we are in the safest place. So, Lord, help us to live that out uh, in your world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.